The Kingdom of Hip, a ten-minute story written and narrated by Joshua Bond. Once upon a time, there was a very special kingdom, and like many kingdoms, it was ruled by an overbearing king and an overarching theory, neither of which anyone dared to question, if you wanted to see your next birthday, that is. The theory, or paradigm as clever clogs call it, that ruled this kingdom had become culturally embedded. All that means is, if you ever wanted to actually change the structure of the society that grew up around it, it would be very difficult. And the particular theory that ruled this kingdom was called the survival of the hippest, hence the title of this story, The Kingdom of Hip. It was very simple, really. The more hip you were, the more the doors opened in terms of money, careers, wealth, power, fame, and so on. And conversely, those who are not naturally hip experience life at a terrible disadvantage. That's why, amongst other things, the whole education system was geared towards increasing one's ability to be hip. It was all very competitive because so much hinged on this one single ability. To make matters worse, over time, as often happens, this theory of the survival of the hippest had gradually achieved the status of fact, backed up by science no less, even though it was still just a theory in which people, for whatever reason, believed. And once it was given the status of fact, it soon became enshrined in law. And once it became law, it resulted in people being hauled before the courts and being judged and punished for not demonstrating sufficient proficiency in being hip, for not aligning themselves adequately with the prevailing theory-belief-assumed fact made law. This bizarre setup was taken to such an extent that those who failed their hip ability final exams were banished from the kingdom altogether, causing on such occasions some very emotional scenes. Such was the case in the kingdom of hip. But all this was about to change. Now Stanley and Susanna were the hippest couple in the kingdom. They had won the kingdom's main hip couple of the year competition, an unprecedented ten times in a row, and doors to wealth, fame and an enviable lifestyle had opened in their direction. In due course, Stanley and Susanna had twins, a boy and a girl, whom they named Atlas and Zoe. Naturally, they were presented as the hippest couple of babies in the kingdom. As they grew older, however, Stanley and Susanna became increasingly concerned, because both Atlas and Zoe showed absolutely no signs whatsoever of having any natural talent at all at being hip. But you've got to hand it to their parents. They tried everything. Extracurricular tuition in being hip, and eventually expensive private schooling, which promised to draw out of each pupil every ounce of hipness that was in them. The trouble was, Atlas and Zoe just did not seem to have even half an ounce of hipness to be drawn out of them in the first place. Stanley and Susanna became increasingly frantic with worry. As still the hippest couple in the kingdom, they could hardly blame their children's lack of hipness on genetics, i.e. on their nature. And this put the blame fairly and squarely on their nurture which Stanley and Susanna as dedicated parents took to be solely their responsibility. Not surprisingly, as parents, they felt like total failures. They, the long-standing and hippest couple in the kingdom, had two children who were the least hip teenagers of all. What's more, the prospect of their children failing their final exams and being banished from the kingdom forever was looming as a distinct possibility. 
Worse still, Stanley and Susanna had long since been publicly in favour of this law, declaring that it maintained the high level of hipness in the kingdom, something that was also believed to make a significant contribution to the kingdom's economics. A couple of years later, the big test came. And like many parents in the kingdom, after their children had done the big exams, they waited, sick with worry, for the results to pop through the post. Then, one morning, a couple of stressful days later than expected, plop, in they dropped through the letterbox. Trembling with concern, they opened the envelopes and read the worst. Both Atlas and Zoe had not only not got an F for fail, but a U for unclassified. The examiners had been unable to classify their efforts, so pathetic had they been judged. Fortunately, Stanley and Susanna were not only just very hip, they were also very savvy, clear and determined. If the Ministry of Hip banished their children from the kingdom, as with these results they surely would, then they, long-standing ambassadors for the validity of HIP, would go with their children and leave the kingdom as well. And by using their contacts, they made a big splash in the media all about their decision. Now, by questioning the underpinning belief in the survival of the hippest, Stanley and Susanna not only put the Ministry of Hip in a quandary, but also the king and the whole basis of his government. So behind closed doors, the king offered a special deal to pardon Atlas and Zoe. However, to their credit, their parents absolutely refused, stating that it would be totally unfair if they got a special favour just because they were rich and famous. That would never do. There seemed only one other option, which was to question the unquestionable. Perhaps the belief in and assumed fact of the survival of the hippest, widely regarded as it was, was not the only philosophy by which the kingdom could be run. Perhaps other ideas, theories and beliefs also had value, if not were even equally as important. Maybe people could make a valid contribution to the kingdom in ways other than merely being hip. Perhaps it was time to update, as it were, the current belief system. It was a very radical thought, but a seed idea had been sown. And gradually it grew. Slowly but surely, Inclusivity became more hip than exclusivity. Until, of course, at some point in the future, when the pendulum would swing too far in the opposite direction. Catalyzed by the dilemma their children had gifted them, Stanley and Susanna redefined themselves as leaders of the new hip, in which unhip children were encouraged to find their buried talents and make their contribution to the kingdom in their unique but albeit unhip, ways. Zoe discovered her love for building dry stone walls, became an expert in this field and built a significant business around it. She offered activity holidays to rebuild various castle walls, something for which the king was very grateful. And Atlas discovered his love for Tunisian macrame, specialising in making personalised macrame bra knickers and underwear for the rich and famous. And rumour has it that both the king and queen own a number of these very expensive and exclusive items. With this success, of course, both dry stone wall building and personalised Tunisian macrame underwear became ultra hip, which goes to show that there is nothing so practical and enduring as a good theory. <laughs>